guys. Um, in the last couple weeks, both Steve Shives and the Messianic Maniac, two people whom I support on Patreon, put out videos on 10 questions for every atheist. I'm going to do the same, but I'm not going to answer the questions. I'm going to ask questions about the questions. When I first saw the video, it was from Steve's channel, and I went to the article when I decided I wanted to investigate this further, and I was really disappointed, because it wasn't an article. It's just um, Today Christian Christianity. I'll put a link in the D-box. But um, it was just a list of questions. It wasn't like, ask these questions or how to ask them. It was just 10 questions every atheist has to ask, and then 10 questions, and no way to respond. <laughs> so um, I guess they can ask us questions, but we can't answer, maybe? Um, but I decided to investigate these questions from the perspective of, social, of a social scientist rather than just answering them because I think actually in some ways it's more interesting to look at that and what the questions tell us than to answer the questions. So instead of answering the questions, I'm going to ask what is the purpose behind this and also what do these questions indicate or suggest to me based on my investigations of people going into deconversion and also uh, the way that Christian, some Christian fundamentalists present atheists. I'm going to give a general overview and in that overview I want to just talk about some of the qualities of questions that make for good survey research. And then I want to look at the 10 questions from the article, not individually, but themed. So you'll see these themes as they come up. In general, interview questions need to be well organized. If you're asking people questions, presumably you want to know something. And if you have a whole series of questions, presumably you want to organize it in such a way that makes it easy for people to go from one topic to the next. So you really don't want a situation where you're asking people, say, about their shopping habits, and then asking them where they went on vacation, and then asking them when was the last time you had a prescription written. All of this requires people to access different parts of their brains, different parts of their experiences, and there's a bit of a lag time. So if you construct questions in such a way that you start, let's say, tell me about where you were 10 years ago. Where were you living? What was your job? What were you doing? Um, if you weren't old enough to work, where were you going to school? And put the person in that mindset and then ask them questions about it. There's really no natural flow to these 10 questions. There's no time flow. They just seem to be jumping all over the way, all over the place. The questions themselves are not really worded in a neutral way to get the best answers. The person writing the question hasn't given a lot of thought to the framing, the implicit framing that they've put up. Because again, if you are actually interested in what people have to say, then you don't want them reacting to you. <laughs> you want them to give you their information, not like reacting to your biases. So neutral wording is the way to get best um, data, the best answers possible. Specific is terrific. This was the motto given to me by my 12th grade English teacher, Mr. Hauser, that whenever you want to write an essay, investigate something, be very specific as to what it is you're investigating. Don't use vaguely worded questions. Don't use confusing concepts. Because if you do, you might think you're going to be getting the data, um, but you're going to get a, uh, information from people's interpretations or stuff that you never even wanted. There are ways to construct interview questions, survey questions, in quantitative or qualitative research that will get a good answer. So now that you have a general idea of some of the things, we can look at the questions themselves. The website, it's not even an article like I said, just a website says, some questions atheists cannot truly and honestly really answer, which leads to some interesting conclusions. And then there's just that list of questions. I just am wondering, the author of this article, why does this person, or anyone reading it, think that atheists cannot truly or honestly answer any of the questions posed? It seems to me that the person writing this setup, there are possibly three options, maybe others, but there are at least three that might have driven this. One, this Christian is accusing all atheists of being liars. That is a possibility. Option two, they wrote this line before they started writing questions and then failed to realize that each question is completely answerable. And third, they don't understand that with adverbs, more is less. Um, and all caps doesn't help. So I don't understand why they kind of put this up here. Uh, what I guess it was probably clickbait, but the fact is that it's idiotic more than anything. And, and anyone who would give it a second thought would read through the questions and realize that atheists are perfectly capable of both truly and honestly 
Same word, again, I mean it's a synonym, answer the questions. First problem, it's not 10 questions, it's 15 plus a statement. I counted. Uh, yes, there are 10 bullet points, but there are not 10 questions. There are multiple questions sometimes inside of a question. That's a problem, because that's lying. When you tell people you have 10 questions, you should really ask them just 10 questions, not 15 questions and slide in a statement. So just on the basics, can't count. Double-barreled questions. A double-barreled question is a question in which you have to answer on two topics or in multiple ways. So did you find your experience refreshing and restful? You might have found it restful, but not refreshing. You might have found it refreshing, but not restful. So how are you meant to answer that question? You really can't, and that's a double-barreled question. The way, um, in terms of the, the 10 questions that atheists allegedly cannot answer, um, double barrels it is by putting multiple questions within a question. So, an example is, what if you're wrong, question mark, and there is a, and there is a heaven, question mark, and there is a hell, exclamation point. What, what am I supposed to answer? Am I supposed to answer in relationship to being wrong about just God in general, or am I only meant to answer about heaven or hell? Or what about people who are Buddhist or reincarnation? I mean, so again, this is um, clearly not meant to be a sincere or honest attempt to understand where people are coming from. There are two other examples of double-barreled questions in this top 10 list, or the 10 questions list. One is, if there is no God, can we do what we want? Are we free to murder and rape while good deeds are unrewarded? I guess, um, I think that's a fragment, not, a sen not in sentence, but... And the other one is, what about miracles? What all, sick, the people who claim to have con a connection with Jesus, what about those who claim to have seen saints or angels? I guess they're Catholic, if they're talking about saints. So this is an example, again, of a very poor question construction. That's not clear what the question, just more, is supposed to be getting at. And because the person posing the questions presumably now rhetorical, I would say, that um, there's, you couldn't actually answer it consistently. Ten different atheists might give ten different answers, not because uh, they have different opinions on whether or not there's sufficient evidence for the existence of God, but because they're responding to different things in the question. So again, fail. Questions that suggest bias. I have two in here. The first one is clearer than the second one. How did you become an atheist? This assumes a person became an atheist. Some people were never raised in religion, so it excludes those people initially. Um, and the person, I guess, doesn't, the person asking the question didn't consider the fact that some people might be raised without religion. That just doesn't, didn't occur to that person. But that again is a, an example of the questioner's bias that will then feed into the response data. The last bias question I'm going to discuss is, what's your view of Dawkins, Hitchens, and Harris? not entirely sure what this has to do with atheism or why an atheist would be completely incapable of giving an honest or truly honest response to this. But what I think the person here is going for is they presume that atheists are like Christians, like they themselves. Christians, fundamentalists or apologists, appeal to authority. And they assume that atheists will also appeal to authority. Of course, the difference between atheists and Christians on that uh, on that score is that atheists actually don't have we don't appeal to authority we appeal to evidence so for me the reason why the person is asking this question isn't because they actually care what atheists think about Dawkins or Hitchens or Harris they want to align atheists with the most strident the most outspoken people and connect us to anything that they see as flawed about those people. And this is a, it's kind of a, to quote Sarah Palin, it, Palin it's a gotcha question. It's assuming that uh, you're gonna answer in a specific way. Another problem with the top 10 or the 10 questions is uh, the person didn't read, I don't know if they read through them after they wrote them, because if they had, they'd realize that they are wasting question space. They ask the same question twice. I say twice, but they actually ask it four times. Let me show you. One of the questions is, without God, where do you get your morality from? I never understood why people think this is a stumper of a question, because William Lane Craig and uh, the other guy in some of my videos that I've done research on, a lot of Christian ministers will go on and say, oh, of course, atheists can be moral people. You don't need God, you know, to believe in God to be a good person. And yet, on the other hand, they go, well, without God, where do you get your morality? I kind of wish that, like, the apologetics, the Christian community would 
to have a conversation with themselves and decide once and for all, is it the case that atheists can be moral, because we've seen it and we see a lot of Christian creatures saying that, or without God you can't get morality and they'll just have to figure out a way to deal with their observations. But I've never understood why where do you get your morals from is some kind of a stumper of a question. And then the next, not the next question, but a further question is, if there is no God, can we do what we want? Are we free to murder and rape while good deeds are unrewarded? That again is the same question. Um, so if you were interested in morality, you've got that question in there. Why are you wasting everybody's time asking three questions within one question about a question you've already asked? Proofreading, it's key. Assuming the thing that you are asking about. One of the questions says, what about miracles? What all, sick, the people who claim to have a connection with Jesus? What about all um, those who claim to have seen saints or angels? This is assuming a Catholic worldview, if they're talking about saints, presumably, um, and the existence of miracles. It presumes all these things, like, what about miracles? Well, miracles, you have to show me a miracle first. So again, the whole framing of this is, is really meant not to ask honest questions, but to try to push atheists into a worldview. They expect us to somehow not be able to respond to this. I think it's mostly because they don't listen to what we have to say when we do respond. But um, the last thing that I want to touch upon is this isn't social science. This is going to be me more engaging in speculation based on my experience and, and observation. Very quickly, when I moved to Europe uh, for the first time, I would tell people, and I found that I, the reaction I got had less to do with me moving to Europe and more to do with the person who was responding to my news. So if the person was excited for me um, and they would like to do that, they would say, oh, I wish I could do that. Um, it would be so great to just pick up and move. Other people would say things like, aren't you afraid you're not going to make friends? Aren't you afraid you're going to get lost? Aren't you worried that? And I, I found that the I, aren't you worried that or aren't you afraid of kinds of questions were never about me. They were about the person asking the question. And with that knowledge, I went back and looked at some of the questions in order to see what was motivating the person writing the questions. What were the things that they valued or feared or had anxiety about that when confronted by somebody who doesn't believe in God, what things do they feel in reaction to that that we can see from these questions? And there are three particular ones that I see as indicating the mindset of the person writing it more than a genuine interest in atheists. Those questions are, what happens when we die? Obviously, someone, if you're a Christian and an atheist comes up to you and says, I don't believe in your God, that might produce anxiety within them about their fear of death and whether or not there really is a heaven and a hell. The next question is, what if you're wrong and there is a heaven and there is a hell? Uh, clearly spiritual terrorism. <laughs> this is basically saying uh, fear, death, fear hell, and because you're afraid of it, do X to avoid it. It's, it's duress. It's an emotional duress. But that, I think, gives you a mindset of the person who's writing the question and the emotional duress that they are under. Finally, if there is no God, how does your life have any meaning? And I, again, this, this seems to be an anxiety a lot of people who are theists have when they talk to atheists. Like, how does life, your life have any meaning? And I can, you know, we as atheists can talk about this a lot and explain to people. The fact is that we find meanings in the same thing that they do. We just don't put a supernatural element on it. We love our partners and we love our kids. We just don't see them as part of a divine plan. We see them as wonderful parts of nature that have en enriched our lives and, and part of the human experience. So I would say, moving forward, these questions can tell us a lot <laughs> about the person writing the question, the level of experience of the person writing the question, the actual interest in opening up a dialogue with atheists on the part of this person. Also, I think there are fears and anxieties. And any Christian who would read through these 15 questions in a statement and think they were good questions and pass it on to an atheist, I think if you get these questions, maybe ask that person why it is that they think that this is, you know, are you afraid of death? Because I'm, I don't think nobody wants to die, but I'm dealing with my fear of death. Are you? <laughs> um, so instead of, you know, um, I think perhaps consider 
what I said, when people react to something, the questions they ask, are they really asking questions about you or are they expressing their own anxieties? And I think with the deconversion research that I see, this would certainly be something where a person would express anxiety, um, fear of death, as, as, a, as something that kind of keeps them connected to religion. So, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video, and we'll see you next time. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. See ya.